So hello and welcome to Beneficial Insects for a Healthy Garden presented by Jackson County Library Services. And also this program is also co-sponsored by the Master Gardener Association of Jackson County. I'm Carrie Tannehill, Interim Branch Manager of Medford Library. This program, as I mentioned, will be recorded and uploaded to the JCLS Beyond YouTube channel within two weeks. Um, if you do have questions while during the program, please put them in the chat box. We will have a Q&A question and answer time at the end of this program, so you can have your questions ready and they will be answered then. Um, the views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. So today's presenter um, is Christina Lefevre president of Pollinator Project Rogue Valley. Uh, thank you so much for being with us today and we look forward to your presentation. So take it away. Great, thank you. And thank you, Carrie. Uh, um, this is the second presentation that I've done with the Medford Library and it's just so nice. You know, you take care of the technical part and I just show up, that's awesome. Um, and thank you everybody for being here. We, I think there's about 20 folks on the, on the call and I commend you for being inside on such a gorgeous day. I actually considered sitting outside so I could do this, but I thought that could be problematic. So um, maybe spring is in the air and this is a good time to talk about this. A lot of you know me talking about pollinators and I did the first one with the library, what, a month or so ago, and that was about pollinators. But beneficial insects, I have a warm and fuzzy feeling about them. They, um, they're so important and there's so many of them that we don't even really know about. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you um, today on this topic. Um, so this is focused more on what you might want to know about for a veggie garden, although of course it does um, pertain to pollinator plants and so forth. Um, I am gonna say thank you to my friend, Kendra Schwartz Pepper, because she had put some of this together a long time ago and it's since grown, but she did some good basic stuff here. Um, for those of you that are wondering about this photo, this did come out of my garden. Um, these are two beneficial insects that we're gonna talk about. And those are aphids, if you don't know what aphids look like. So um, aphids are good sometimes because they're food and other times they're perhaps not so much. So we'll talk about that. So, I'll tell you a little bit about me in just a second, but in the meantime, as a way of introduction, if you want to put in the chat, what is your favorite beneficial insect other than a bee or a butterfly? Because that's not what I'm really talking about today, although those are extremely beneficial. But other insects, if you have a favorite that you want to share, and then Carrie's going to look at the chat and we'll see what comes up. Um, in the meantime, just thought I'd tell you, um, I am representing Pollinator Project Rogue Valley, um, trying to get people understanding the importance of our pollinators, um, bees, butterflies, but there's so many more, um, and how we can support them in our landscape, in our communities, um, so that we can have a healthy and thriving pollinator population everywhere. I'm also um, with Bee City USA Ashland, and um, that's part of the city. There are many of you probably live in a bee city. We've got Talent was the first one, then Ashland, uh, Phoenix, um, Medford, and Gold Hill, although I don't think they're extremely active right now. And I am a master gardener, although I probably am not one of the best ones, but I am a master gardener and I really appreciate all of the um, education that I gained when I went through the course and afterwards. And a great group of people, if you're interested, maybe not this year, but maybe the next year um, that would be something to consider. So do we have any favorite beneficial insects, Carrie, that people wanted to share? We do, we have um, ladybugs, anything that eats aphids, lady beetles, wasps, and praying mantis. Cool, I like that wasp person, whoever said that, that was a really good choice. And of course, praying mantis, I'm not gonna talk about them today, but yes, there's so many. So this is what I sort of wanna cover today. I, this is what I want to cover today, not sort of. What is an insect? Why do we care about them? Which ones are the best? Which is totally in quotation marks. This is the ones I chose. And then how do we get them and keep them in our garden? So I'm gonna cover a lot of ground today, I think. You wanna um, listen to it? Beg your pardon? I. Oh. <laughs> um, so um, I'm gonna try to cover a lot of ground, but um, 
if I need to repeat something, please interrupt, let Carrie know. Otherwise, just put your questions in the chat and then we'll go through that um, at the end, okay? So what is an insect? Um, this is, maybe some of you remember this from your school, I don't know. Uh, there are millions and millions. Uh, the most successful group of all animals on the planet, our planet would be, would not exist without insects, basically. Um, in my little research I was doing, apparently there's about 1 million described species of insects, but scientists feel confident that that is maybe 20th or 20% 20 of the ones that are out there. Five to 10 million species could be out there. We just haven't identified them. Um, think about the um, Amazon rainforest, for instance, and what is has not been discovered there. Three quarters of all animal species are insects equaling about two thirds of all life on the earth. If you have a healthy moist acre, you could perhaps find 4 million insects. That's a lot of insects. Um, there's a few pictures down there that show you some of the different types of insects there are. And then I've listed on the side here, um, a lot of the different types of insects and the approximate number of species. So, um, there's 12,000 species of ants, 20,000 species of bees, 400,000 species of beetles. How can that be? I don't understand that. And I did not get my zeros mixed up. Flies, 110,000 species. Spiders, 45,000. I'm not gonna talk about spiders. I would love to do a whole presentation on spiders. They are fascinating creatures. Um, and wasps and hornets. I never did get around to getting the number, but um, they're so important. So why do we care about insects? All right. One, obviously pollination. We need them for our crops to eat. They pollinate what's around us, the trees and the wildflowers, go hiking up on Grizzly Peak. Somebody's making those flowers happen. Um, they feed other species. This is so important. This is a really big um, point of all of this, that insects are part of the food chain. Um, they provide products, honey, obviously, silk. Most of those are for human consumption, but obviously bears love honey. Um, they eat other insects, what we consider to be pests. Um, again, this is a really important part of the whole, <laughs> the whole ecosystem. They eat plants, which could be good. If it's a bad plant that we consider a bad plant, or it could be bad if, it, if we want to eat that plant instead. They do improve soil biology. They remove and or recycle detritus. Think about what the world would be like without dung beetles and other creatures that eat the stuff that's dead. They die and biodegrade and they get into the soil. What else? You don't have to put it in the chat, but just sort of think, what else do insects provide? Unless you want to put it in the chat, you might have a good, a good uh, answer. Um, so I was thinking, pardon? Apologize for interrupting. We did have a question asking what are true bugs? True bugs, they are a different kind of bug. Oops, going back. Um, and they would fit a certain definition. So a bug is a word that people use to sort of in a broad sense, but a true bug, there is actually a species. So I can't think of one at the moment. I am not, I should tell you, I'm not an entomologist, so my learning here is through uh, my own education. And if somebody knows what a true bug is in a scientific way, then please put it in the chat and it'll help all of us. Then we had a response to you, why care about insects? Their response was entertainment. I like that one. I did not have that on my list. What I had on my list was beauty because I think they're beautiful and amazing. I could have put amazement on there too. So this moth, as you can see now, is um, from Australia, actually, I think it's New Guinea, called the Hercules moth. This female has an 11 inch wide wingspan. That is the size of a piece of paper wide this way. That's a big moth. So it's amazing the diversity from microscopic to this large um, that it still fits into the in, um, definition of insect. So this is so important. Who depends on insects? 
we already know humans do because they pollinate our crop. Um, some people actually eat insects. I don't know if y'all have gotten into that yet, but people do. Um, you know, even milk, alfalfa is pollinated um, by alfalfa leafcutter bees, and that's um, what the cows, cow, yeah, alfalfa is, pop, is uh, pollinated, and then the cows eat the alfalfa, and then they provide milk. So even that is from a pollinated crop. Um, other species are dependent on these insects. Birds, obviously, insects, um, caterpillars, amphibians, uh, frogs, toads, lizards, such an important um, food source for them. Bats, huge, bears, moths, and obviously bees. We all know that story, fish. This is a really important food source um, for fish. So um, if there's a dearth, if there's not enough insects in the aquatic area, then fish are actually going to, um, to suffer. For those of you that are fisher people, um, you, I'm sure you know about caddisflies, uh, mayflies, and things like that. I want to tell you a little story about bears and moths. So if you're vegetable gardeners, you know about the army cutworm. And that is something that you really don't want in your vegetable garden because it actually cuts the little seedling and then you have no seedling. So if you think about those moths um, and those caterpillars in the agricultural community out in the Midwest, farmers aren't real happy with those, right? Well, did you know that the army cutworm turns into a moth and it flies from the Midwest area it flies to the mountains of Colorado in the late summer so that it can, you know, have enough food there, nectar and pollen, and then it will um, overwinter there. And they go into the rocks to um, be protected. Well, the bears know about that. Turns out that one moth is equal to half a calorie and a bear can eat 40,000 moths in a day. So that would be 20,000 calories that those moths are giving that bear. That's pretty amazing right there. Okay, so what happens now if the farmers in Iowa or wherever spray pesticides on those fields because they don't want the cutworms? So I'll let you answer that story. So I'm just letting you know that even there's such a connection that's not even just in your own backyard to how these insects support our world. Um, and speaking of pest control, so pest control companies, this is a national figure. This is, you know, th there's nothing specific here to insects in your gardens, but <clears throat> think about the, the amount of income that pest control companies are making, um, anywhere from four and a half to 12 billion a year, depending on who you're looking at. Um, I would like to say that if companies knock on, come and knock on your door, and say that we need to help you get rid of all of your insects around your exterior of your house, I would seriously consider not having that happen. Um, spiders and other creatures like that are often really needed and for many of these reasons. Um, and so I just think that that would be something for you to um, consider that that is not necessarily the way we want to have our ecosystem. So, Another reason that insects are so important is because other insects eat them. So these are pictures that I've taken. I don't, I'm hoping that you can see these. Um, this is a spider eating a bumblebee. This is just the back end of a bumblebee here. Um, this one over here is a jumping spider. For those of you that are familiar with spiders, you can see the two little eyes there and it's consuming a hoverfly. So we're gonna talk about hoverflies in just a minute. And then this one was, it's really a bad picture, I'm sorry, but um, this is a black wasp right here. And this is a spider um, abdomen here, thorax, I guess. And then this is the spider legs right there. This might be the head. This, I, I actually have a video of this, but it was such a bad video, I couldn't show. I found this happening um, on a sidewalk in downtown Ashland. They were having a battle. It took them about, I, I videoed minutes long and the wasp was definitely consuming the spider. So there you go. 
love and death out there all the time. Um, birds also depend on insects. Um, probably most of you know about the decline of birds um, across the globe. And one of the reasons is, is because of the major decline of um, caterpillars, which turn into butterflies or army cutworm moths. Um, but according to Doug Tallamy, and I should have put his name on here, if you are not familiar with Dr. Doug Tallamy, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y, T-A-L-L-A-M-Y, I highly recommend you looking him up. And so he's been letting people know about the amount of um, bird declines because there aren't enough caterpillars, because there are not enough native plants in people's yards. So for instance, a chickadee um, couple, they need to find 500 caterpillars if you want to round it off um, every day, depending on how many chicks they are feeding, uh, which equals about one caterpillar every three minutes just to have three to four chicks turn into adults. That's a lot of caterpillars. I don't think I have that many in my yard, although we do have birds. Um, and so this one last slide here to, before I move on to the individual um, insects. Um, I love this little poster from Pollinator Friendly Yards. All your life you've been told these are bugs, but they're not, they're bird food. So if you think about that concept, you can really change your mindset. And for some of those, for some of us who might be of that certain age, you probably remember windshields that look like the one on the top right, but now all we see is the one on the lower left, unless maybe you're going through the Klamath Lake area, but um, they're just not out there. Oh yeah, one last slide here, um, just for more depressing news and we'll move on. Um, this has been a trend that's been going on since the 70s, if not before the decline of so many um, insects around the globe. Um, and then in 2019, there was a review of 73 studies and it just um, reiterated that we're continuing to lose insect species pretty much at that same rate. So I feel that you know people need to know that um, and that we need to help support them, which really does mean providing food and not using pesticides. Um, so we'll talk about that. If insect species losses cannot be halted, this will have a catastrophic consequence for both the planet's ecosystems and for the survival of mankind. So the concept of beneficial is subjective, right? It only arises in the light of desire, desired outcomes from a human perspective. I probably would think that an aphid would say it's beneficial, right? I mean, there you go. So we're going, um, we're defining this from our human perspective. And so many millions of species and such a small percentage of that would actually be detrimental to humans in some way. So insects are really important. Um, all the different species provide a certain niche in the ecosystem and they're valuable for that. And I would like to suggest that a bug is innocent until proven guilty. Um, know your bugs. There's gonna be some of these that we're gonna look at that are scary looking or surely that's a bad bug because of the way it looks, but I can guarantee you that it's a good one, unless you're another insect perhaps. So what are the benefits of beneficials? They make more plants by helping us pollinate. They get rid of pests. All these are some of the ones that are probably every human would say is a pest. Um, they're beautiful. We already talked about that and they work for free almost because you have to feed them. So if you think of an insect and what category, these would probably be four good categories to put them in. They're either a predator, meaning they are, they're gonna hunt and kill and consume another insect. They're parasitoids, meaning that other insect is their host for their babies. So they use other insects as hosts for their larva that eventually will kill that host. So if you're not into blood and gore, then somewhere along the way, you might wanna not watch this. No, I'm kidding. It's not that bad. Um, and then some of these are pollinators and they can cross over. So you can be a predator and a pollinator, uh, a parasitoid and a pollinator. Um, and then we have the decomposers, which I'm not gonna talk about, but they're so important. Dung beetles, um, otherwise we would be up to our eyeballs and try this. 
So we've talked about what's an insect, why do we care about them now, which ones are the best in parenthesis, uh, in quotation marks. This is just my personal opinion, which can change tomorrow. Okay, so we have predators. We have a hoverfly, also known as a surfeit fly, also known as a flower fly, whichever name you want to use, a lacewing, a soldier beetle, a lady beetle, a big eyed bug, a predatory mite. Those are all defined as predators, but you notice four of them can also be a pollinator. And then on the parasitoid side, the tachinid fly, and then we have parasitic wasps. And there's so many more species of parasitic wasps, but these are the ones that you would probably see. So I'll show you a slide on that. And then you can see down at the bottom, I started another list of all the other ones that I can think of off the top of my head. So, and I'm sure there's plenty more. And there's wasps on there twice, the, the parasitoids and the larger wasps like yellow jackets or uh, others. So here's a hoverfly. I would bet that everybody on this um, call has seen a hoverfly. Um, you might think it is a bee. Um, it has sort of that same coloration, more or less the same size as a honeybee, but I'm going to draw your attention to a couple of, well, a number of things that totally make this not be a bee. See how short these antenna are. They're coming right out of the nose area. Um, the eyes are big, facing forward. They're really big, bad eyes. Be honeybees have them on the side of their head. Um, there's hardly a hair on here. I mean, there is little tiny ones, but it's not fuzzy like a honeybee. Um, it only has two wings. Honeybees, uh, bees, all bees have four wings, two on each side. Um, and look how um, skinny and, and non-hairy these legs are. They're not collecting pollen on that leg. So these are hoverflies. I love hoverflies. They're lovely. Um, they look different. They have different varieties, different species, I guess. Um, these are both hoverflies. And you can see how fat this body is. I should, that's another difference between um, bees and bees. It's a very stocky body. Um, here's another hoverfly, but this one's more slender, a little different coloration. Um, I've seen hoverflies out there just teeny tiny, but you can still see the antenna and, and the coloration. Um, they're a pollinator. They're one of the most important after you go down from honeybee and, and native bees, um, solitary bees, then the hoverfly is like the next in line. Um, and they like sweet alyssum. If you're not growing sweet alyssum, go out and get sweet alyssum, white sweet alyssum, um, buckwheat, the annual buckwheat, not the native plant, um, mints, zinnia, yarrow, parsley. If you notice, those are all small flowered plants and you're gonna see a number of these plants repeated on the slides. This is why you want the hoverfly in your garden. In addition to being a great pollinator, it's also a great predator in the larval stage. These are hard to see. The larval, you can see the larva um, with your naked eye. Um, you just have to be in the right place at the right time. They're a predator, so they're gonna take out aphids like crazy. Um, they, this is a, a larva right here, and it's got an aphid right here, and it's just gonna suck it dry. Here's another photo um, of an aphid here. So you can see the size of these things. So you can easily see them. You just have to be looking for them. Um, they can eat, one larva can eat 50 aphids in a day, which doesn't seem like a lot in the grand scheme of things. If you, I mean, you saw the stem in my garden, but if you have a lot of them, it adds up. Um, I'm not gonna show you this video in the interest of time, but um, farmers in California use hoverflies for biological control. And there's a really cool video there of that. Um, and they live a while, nine weeks. Lacewing, these are beautiful little creatures. Um, quite large, you would see this easily in your garden. Um, they can be brown, but those are usually in the woods, so you probably won't see brown ones as much. Um, they are a pollinator, so they go for pollen and nectar as well as in the adult stage, but they're also a predator um, in the adult stage, again, taking out aphids, thrips, um, mealybugs, um, and not all thrips are bad, by the way. I just want to interject that. I should probably specify that. I've learned that, so not all thrips are bad either. Um, plants, um, Again, yarrow, dill, fennel, coriander, small flowered plants. This is why you really want lace wings. The larva 
also known as an aphid lion because they do such a good job eating aphids. This is an aphid right here. And here's your um, <clears throat> larva of the lacewing. And they eat um, aphids. That's why they call it an aphid lion. Mealybugs, spider mites, leafhopper, nymphs, et cetera, et cetera. 200 aphids in a week per larva. And if you ever see this, you are lucky and make sure it stays protected. These are the eggs up on the top of the filaments. Um, and I've read somewhere that the reason the female does this, the reason it's evolved like this is because these are such voracious eaters. There won't be any, well, there'll be just one aphid lion left. So they will eat each other. So they do it this way so that they can be protected as they emerge and they come down in their different, <laughs> different elevations as they emerge from their eggs. So ultra beetle, this is very obvious in your garden. This is not, um, this is not a firefly. We don't have fireflies here on the West Coast. I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast thinking, oh my God, they're already extinct here, but actually we have no fireflies here. So uh, if you've ever thought that, then that's, that's why. Um, these are about a half an inch long and they are a pollinator, probably not a great pollinator, but they do get on flowers to get pollen and nectar. Um, they're a great predator for aphids and other insects, marigolds, flowering herbs, daisy. Now here, this one has golden rods. So we're, we added a different flower, cosmos, fennel, linden trees, milkweed. So this is a little bit um, um, greater um, variety. And I don't think I've ever seen a larva in real life, although I have plenty of soldier beetles. I just must not have been out there in the right time. But I think these are so beautiful. I just want to touch those. They look so soft. Um, and they're a really great um, predator of beetles, grasshoppers, slugs. We need this one for slugs. Um, and then they have, they live for about a year. This is another video. Um, it just, it's a video about um, soldier beetles, but it's more from the East Coast. They're more yellow on the East Coast. Ours are um, black and red, but you would learn a lot from, from watching that. Lady beetles, hopefully everybody knows what a lady beetle is. Um, such a great thing to have in your garden um, pollinator because it does get on the flower for the pollen and nectar as in the adult stage. And then it's also a predator in the adult stage. You really want to have lady beetles uh, in your garden. 5,000 aphids in a lifetime, that's pretty good. Uh, or in the, in the adult stage, sorry, in the adult stage, uh, that's a lot of aphids. Um, also thrips, mites, mealybugs. Here's plants, you know, I'm getting repetitive. Sweet alyssum, yarrow, cilantro. Um, I'm not gonna watch this video, it's a short one, but there's two videos in this presentation that if, if you don't watch any others, you need to watch this one and I'll point out another one later. This is a great video, you'll love it. Um, it's also a predator in the larval stage. This is a uh, Ladybug larvae do not kill these things, even though they are probably not the most prettiest thing you've ever seen. Um, but uh, they're really important uh, because they're such great aphid eaters. Here's the eggs. So it goes from this stage to this stage to this stage. This is the pupa. And so back to this slide here, you can see here from the pupa, it's emerging to become a the, the adult, that's probably in a little bad order, but that's how it fit on my slide. And then um, they can live for more than a year. And this is another um, great video. If you're not into uh, blood and gore, then you don't wanna watch it. Um, and then I just wanna point out um, that there are non-native lady beetles out there. It's actually a concern in the country from east to west that we have so many non-native uh, lady beetles coming in. So if you are going to purchase lady beetles, then please ask your supplier which ones, which species it is. So this is an ODA um, uh, publication. And if you click on this link, you'll see the two page document. So you'll have that. Um, and so these are four species right here that are non-native. So um, I believe the seven spotted beetle is a pretty common one, so. The kinid fly, okay, this is a fly. It's really a fly, it's not a house fly. I think they're cute. Probably people think I'm crazy. These are large, you will see these in your garden. And I wanna point out on this slide because it's so easy to see how bristly this little guy is. It's kind of shiny, the head looks different than a house fly. 
I'm not a proponent of house flies, but the tachinid flies, I, you know, they're, they're so ugly, they're cute, I guess. Um, they are a pollinator in the adult stage. Um, again, these small flowered flowers, carrots, coriander, the non-native buckwheat that people use as cover crops. Um, and then in the um, larval stage, it is an excellent parasitoid. Very, so we've flipped over to parasitoids now. I forgot to say that. We're on the second column of my first slide, um, listing all of them. So now this is a parasitoid, not a predator. So this means the larva of the tachinid fly is gonna take out the other insect um, by consuming it in some form. So the tachinid fly larva is laid beside the um, host or the prey insect, and then it eats it. So that's what's happening here. This hatched along with the monarchs. Uh, this, was, this was put beside the monarch caterpillar and it is now consuming it. Here's eggs on the, on the monarch that you can see it, uh, or excuse me, on a caterpillar that you can see it. This is a monarch caterpillar. Um, so people who are raising monarchs do not like tachinid flies, and I understand that. But on the other hand, the tachinid fly um, larva will take out a lot of things in your garden that you may not want. So you have to decide how you're going to handle that. Um, yeah, so I think that was about all I was going to say on that one. Uh, the big eyed bug, I've, I might have seen one of these in my garden. I'm not really sure. They're tiny, an eight to and a quarter inch long. I think they're cute. I'd like to see one. Um, they are a great predator. They have a proboscis that will stick in there and suck out the prey scale. So these can take out smaller things that are smaller than aphids even, the spider mites. And, and I believe these are pictures of scale here. So they can take out 80 spider mites in a day. Same kind of plants. Goldenrod is on this list along with potato, clover, and green beans. So they like those plants and then they'll help protect those plants from the bad guys. Um, these don't have larva, so the egg and then it comes out as a nymph. So you have a baby adult basically. Um, so this is the egg here. And then here's a nymph, doesn't have quite the same um, coloration, same powerful predator um, to take out all of these kind of pests. 1600 spider mites, that's a lot of spider mites. Uh, spider mites are not a good thing, believe me. Speaking of spider mites, okay, predatory mite, you will not see this insect unless you have a microscope. So this is the predator. They are less than 0.02 inches both the larva and the adults can consume about two prey per day, which doesn't seem like much, but you're gonna have a lot of predatory mites in your garden if you don't use pesticides and you have enough food, which probably most of us do. Um, and they'll take out mealybugs, white flies, fungus. So here is a picture of spider mites. These are the bad guys right here. And then these are the predators is more orangey color. So the same here, this is the good guy and this is the bad guy. So they're actually having a battle. This is a fun little video here um, to, to watch. It's very short and you'll get to see um, them duking it out. So, all right. So last insect group here is the parasitic wasps, uh, the braconid, the colcid, the numid, and the trichogramma and you can see the size of these things on here. So you would see the braconid. I've had these in my garden. I'm not sure if I've had this one, but you can see how tiny it is, eighth of an inch. Um, this one is large. I'm sure I've seen these ones, uh, one eighth to one and a half inches. This one, you won't see it, one thirty second of an inch, unless you have a microscope. And this is an egg. So you can see how small this little guy is. Um, these are all parasitoids. There is no stinger on these wasps. These are all, this is an ov ovipositor. I don't see one actually poking out like a stinger, but these will not sting you. The ovipositor is there to lay eggs in its prey, which is what you want it to do. Um, and then this is a quote out of OS and the OSU publication that says, in terms of habitat health, Parasitoids can drive biodiversity and positively influence ecosystem function. 
you want these little creatures. You really, truly do. And here are um, a lot of the flowers and plants will support them. And here are a couple of pictures of what happens when these guys are in your garden. Um, probably a lot of you have seen something like this hornworm that has a lot of um, eggs sitting on there that are going to hatch and just eat that little guy. Um, they can take out aphids, caterpillars, mealybugs, hornworms, armyworms, cutworms, cuddly moths, and bees. The um, halted um, uh, wasps are um, predatory or parasitoids on mason bees. So again, you know, you have to take the good with the bad. Here are aphids down here that are getting a little bit worried about this braconid wasp that's trying to lay eggs. You can see the ovipositor right there. And um, okay, we're gonna watch this one. I think we have time to watch this one. This is a short one. Um, so yeah, let's just do that. This is cool. Oh, you might the most insidious killer is the parasitic wasp. This is a female trying to lay its eggs on the body of the aphid. danger who try to pick the wasp. I don't, I don't want to take up the whole time watching that, but if you want to go back to that and um watch it, that would be great. He shows later the, um, the larva emerging. It's pretty cool, uh, the wasp emerging, I should say. Uh, it's a really great video, um, if you're into that. And then here's the last one, the trichogramma wasp. Um, it's also a parasitoid, but you can see how tiny it is there on that egg. Four to five can fit on the head of a pin. They take out you know, really bad guys. Um, they only live a short time, um, but they can take out like the cuddly moth eggs and things like that. So again, they're really important for keeping a healthy ecosystem. So um, I'll pause for just a minute. Any burning questions before I move on? We did have a response to the true bugs. Someone put in the chat that they're insects, um, such as leafhoppers, aphids, cicadas, stink bugs, water bugs, and yes, bed bugs. They have many of the same parts as other insects and in that they have an exoskeleton, segmented bodies, and six legs. Okay, good. Thank you for that. All right, so now we get to the fun part um, about what can we do? Basically, the best thing to do is plant flowers. We've already gone through so many of them. So here's the pictures of some of them. Again, if you don't have white sweet alyssum, I highly recommend it. Asters, I would go with native. They um, tend to be a little more drought tolerant. They are a fabulous pollinator um, supporting plant, especially the native asters. Um, red creeping thyme, some of these little tiny mints, um, the annual buckwheat that people use as a cover crop. Um, it's also great. The herbs, dill and cilantro, the parasitic wasps really love them. The yarrow, sunflowers, calendula. This is a hoverfly right here. I took this picture um, on a calendula. So you can see that that one looks even a little different. And then native plants um, also obviously provide a lot of um, support for these insects, elderberries. Um, so those, that's just a small list there. Also having habitat and shelter, just like everybody, they need a place to live. Um, they need a place to overwinter. So, you know, having some areas in your yard that are quote messy, or if you want to call, call them wild areas, 
Um, that's great. Hedgerows where there's lots of different um, sizes of plants, just different depths. Um, think about, you know, the fact that creatures can live in the rock walls or piles of rocks, piles of wood. Um, bunch grasses, our native bunch grasses are just so important for the ecosystem for these creatures, as well as um, bees and butterflies, especially butterflies because they're host plants. A lot of the natives are host plants for the butterfly. Caterpillars, um, fallen leaves, leave your leaves as much as you can, please. And then clean up your garden in the spring rather than in the winter. The winter garden is so important for insects and birds and birds. I will repeat that one. Um, a lot of you probably read Rhonda Nowak's um, column in the paper. And this was from a year or two ago. And I just wanted to save this. Um, leave your leaves because the predatory insects, the ones we've talked about, um, overwinter in those leaves and then they're there in the spring. And I just want to point out um, the Xerces um, organization, and I'll have a link for you. Um, they've been, a, this, they've been um, advocating not to get rid of your leaves for years. And I just think it's um, important for us to think about that we as humans at a very large scale often don't think to look. These are chrysalises of the Western swallowtail. If you're pulling out your garden, and you were lucky enough to have one of these pupate and attach a chrysalis to your plant, would you see that? I would have trouble seeing that. So um, they also need water. Um, I found this video, it's not a very good video, but it's really cute. It's very long and you don't wanna watch the whole thing, but have you ever seen a ladybug drink water? There you go, now there's your chance. And then I'm just gonna show this little clip from my garden. I, this is from this past summer. Um, and you're gonna see, I wanna point out a couple of things here. Hold on a second, let me go back. So I wanna point out that you're seeing little black aphids on these fava beans. You're seeing lady beetles and you're gonna see soldier beetles in just a second. And then I want you to watch at some point there, you're gonna see a ladybug larva on the top. Um, left corner of your screen. Are lady beetles flying in? I'm sorry, soldier beetles flying in. Lady beetles. And then somewhere there is a ladybug larva. Okay, right there up at the top left, there's a ladybug larva. There's a lot of aphids on those fava beans and they're coming in. So that's what they say. Feed them and they'll come. Is that what they said? Um, and then the last point to make is no pesticides, please. Um, even an herbicide like Roundup will cause major problems for insects in your yard uh, and landscape, either through drift or from actual application on the ground. So many of these insects live in the soil, on the soil, um, and applying a pesticide on your soil is going to kill. That's what it's for. The pesticide is killing pests. Um, so, and then the drift happens. Um, it can damage the um, gut biome of honeybees and other creatures. Um, so not using um, pesticides is a major um, concern. Not use, I mean, using them is a major concern, so please don't use them. Um, also, insecticides, obviously their purpose is to kill insects. Um, the neonicotinoids are a major concern worldwide. Um, this is something that we should not be selling on the shelf. I firmly believe that. Um, I think there should be laws passed that you should be a, a licensed applicator before you can use neonicotinoids. Unfortunately, you can go to any um, store and purchase these. Um, you will not see the word neonicotinoid on the bottle, but you will see these other lovely words like imidacloprid. This is the most common one. Um, if you go to the wherever and buy this, you will see this on the label. Um, these are systemic pesticides, in insecticides, and insecticide is a pesticide, and herbicide is a pesticide. So these are uh, systemic, and so you hear a lot of um, talk about how these are harming the bee and butterfly populations because obviously um, they're taking the pollen and the nectar, and this is an insecticide, so it gets up into the pollen and the nectar, and it actually kills bees and butterflies, but it also would have an impact on any other insect that might be around. 
um, it's in the root, it's on the leaves, um, and it can't be washed off. It's inside the plant. Um, so oftentimes the beneficial insects are um, most um, impacted because they move around more often. Uh, there was actually a study done on spider mites and um, they were actually, they proliferated um, to the detriment of the predatory mites when the imidacloprid was used. Um, here are a few more bottles just to show you what they look like. These contain um, the imidacloprid as well. Um, and there's actually, this was a study that came out last year that it's not just directly on that insect, but there is actually early mortality from of, of the hoverflies and parasitic wasps that consume honeydew from aphids, mealybugs, et cetera. How many people know what honeydew is? Honeydew is poop. So the honey, the um, aphids secrete a sweet substance, that's why ants farm aphids. So the neonicotinoids were actually applied to a plant taken up by a hoverfly and or a um, parasitic wasp. And then um, they were, uh, or maybe I had it backwards, I'm sorry, I'm flipping it around. So the aphids, the mealybugs, et cetera, um, were affected by the neonicotinoids. And then the hoverflies and parasitic wasps were impacted. So it goes on through the food chain. Um, and then this would be a great um, video to watch. It's quite long, comes out of OSU talking about the um, biological controls using insects in the nursery industry. So it's very um, um, promising where we're going for that kind of thing rather than using pesticides. Just the flow chart to show you how it does go through the ecosystem. You spray neonicotinoids on a tree, it goes on through into the water, into the soil, into the groundwater, the fish are impacted, the birds are impacted. Um, yeah, the neonicotinoids are something that we just don't even need to have. So thank you. May your garden be full of beneficial insects, just like this one. I have a slide here with links, assuming that you want this slide. You don't, I mean, this presentation, you certainly don't have to take it. But if you do, then these are links to all sorts of great things. Um, this one here, Natural Pest Control, is quite interesting. Um, and then here's some books down at the bottom.